it's really wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, uh, Mike Branchley, I did not meet him until today, but his father was one of my favorite instructors at Stone College, a wonderful history teacher. So, um, and Neil, as he was talking, I was very impressed with uh, the knowledge that he has about the new newspaper industry and especially the impact that it had on Sanfi. Historians, and really all of us are as lay historians, have a lot to be grateful for to people in the newspaper industry, writers um, over the years. It's uh, a great blessing. I wanted to give the rejoinder to that uh, comment that Neil started out with uh, from over the mountain in Emory County. He, he shared with us how uh, when uh, notices were posted announcing that land was available over the mountain in Emory County, uh, the, the Emory County people say that, well, they were posted and, and they were the ones that could read and they went over there. But the San Pete County response is, yeah, but those notices were posted upside down. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, that's, we've, there's been this long time of that rivalry between those families, and, and they were close because they were largely people who had originally been settled here in San Pete. I have, a, I have prepared statements that I, or words that I'd like to read from that will keep me on track and then I'll become more extemporaneous or, or uh, just ad lib it after if you'd like to ask me any questions. So it is with great pleasure to be back on the Snow College campus. This setting brings back many wonderful memories from days I spent here as a student and more recently of numerous visits and prolonged hours conducting research in this, the new Huntsman Library. On this occasion, it seems fitting for us to remember that this academic institution was literally carved out of the heart of pioneer Ephraim, a place once graced by historic rock and adobe homes erected by sturdy backs, cracked, um, cracked and calloused hands, inviting abodes with gardens, orchards, barns, and corrals that long ago were removed, <clears throat> making way for the beautiful and expansive college landscape that we behold today. As I look back on my boyhood in San Pete, I realize I grew up surrounded by storytellers, First were the members of my own immediate family. My parents both had an active and healthy respect for and interest in the past. And history was especially evident in the lives of my two grandmothers. On my mother's side, my grandmother Nellie Marguerite Christensen Keller was born at Ephraim in 1904. She was a Scandinavian through and through her father was a native of Mount Pleasant, born to a Danish father and a Norwegian mother. My grandmother's mother was a daughter of Lars Strip Anderson, a Dane and longtime bishop of Ephraim, uh, of the Ephraim North Ward. After their marriage, my grandmother's parents were settled for a time out of Manasseh. But like most residents of that place, eventually gave up on the idea of developing a close but rival city to its brother town and returned to Ephraim. Nonetheless, with their growing children, they maintained a fairly productive farm at Vanessa for quite a few years thereafter. On my father's side, my grandmother Alice Ann Harry Mackey was born in the UK at Merthyr Tidville, Wells in 1888. She came as a young child to the United States with her mother and older brother to be reunited with their husband and father who had come ahead to work in the coal fields of Utah. The, the family eventually came to the San Pete Valley 
where her father labored as a blacksmith beginning in the early 1890s at the Morrison Mine in the mouth of Six Mile Canyon east of Sterling. In addition to the amusing and often hilarious stories shared by my two grandmothers, there were also tales related by older neighbors, family, friends, teachers, and even town barbers. All of these individuals impressed upon me that there was something significant about the past and something unique and special about this place that we know as Sampi. Then during my years as a student at Manti High School, I had the opportunity to participate in an oral history project uh, it was a brainchild of our teacher, Dixie Doris Bond, Evans now, I believe. I interviewed two veterans, one a soldier from World War I and the other from World War II. You know, after all of that experience, uh, it, all of that experience would continue to influence me over the years at Snow and at BYU and then at Arizona State University. In fact, some important details from those interviews informed the research I conducted to write the two volumes about Sam Pete's past. A major objective of my research from the outset has been to examine significant events and people largely overlooked by previous writers, to give voice to voices long silent. The first volume covered as much as I could find about the history of the area prior to 1849, and then the coming of white settlers up to about 1879. Volume 2 focuses primarily on the years during the construction of the Manti Temple and coming of the railroad up to 18, or 1929, so roughly a period of five decades. These were years of great change not only in San Pete and Utah, but across the nation. Early on in my work on this second volume, a couple of things soon became apparent. First, other than the building of the temple, not much had been written about San Pete during the period, this period. The reason for this, I believe, is that many of the chroniclers at that time wrote only about the pioneer era, and not their own years of existence. It was too close to them, and it, seemed that it, and it seems that it is human nature to dismiss one's own life and times, thinking of it as less important. Second, I soon realized that there was a remarkable amount of information available on this period through the county's newspapers. So there were lots of subjects to consider details to filter through, questions and theories to test against the, the available evidence. The Scandinavian festival, now in its 42nd year, conjures up images of a particular era in rural Utah, the realities of which would in many respects seem strange and unfamiliar to those of us living in the 21st century. Moreover, it harkens back even further to a distant time and place extending across thousands of miles and nearly 200 years of history. The festival celebrates as much as anything what Ephraim native Grace Johnson expressed in text from her Mormon miracle. A single occurrence may set in motion a chain of events that covers years, even centuries. I want to take us back on a journey to an Ephraim in San Pete County that would have been very familiar to Miss Johnson and the pioneer storytellers whom she personally knew following her birth in 1896. In, do in doing so, I want to introduce you to two couples whose lives provide compelling stories about the journey and existence at this place. Paul E. and Fanny Myrick Coford, and Henry and Augusta Rasamina Dorius Stevens. 
Individuals whose lives exemplify the diverse backgrounds of the people who settled early at Fort Ephraim. In the case of the Coforts, <coughs> Fanny was born in 1831 at Apple Prairie, Green County, Illinois. Her parents were baptized into the LDS faith two years later by Elder Parley P. Pratt, and they soon moved to Missouri. Gathering with the saints in the land of Zion came in fulfillment of the Myrick family's fondest hopes, but establishing permanent Mormon settlement in the state proved impossible due to intense persecution. Relocating at a spot on Shoal Creek in 1838, known as Hans Mill, the place became a death trap for them and their neighbors. On October 30th of that year, a Missouri militia mob, whipped to a frenzy by Governor Boggs's recently issued extermination order, descended on the tiny enclave. Mormon men who gre greeted the galloping horsemen were, uh, with pleas of peace were immediately gunned down. Seven-year-old Fanny fled into the surrounding thicket with a brother and their mother who carried a baby in her arms. They lay in the woods through the darkness of the long night. The following day was a heartbreaking time for the Myrick family as Fanny's father <coughs> as Fanny's father's body was found in the blacksmith shop where he had been murdered and her 10-year-old brother, Charles, was found mortally wounded. Brigham Young assisted the remaining Myrick family members to safety in Illinois. Fanny's paternal grandfather encouraged her mother to come live near them and he would ensure a comfortable home and good education for the children. The widow refused and took her family to what would become Nauvoo and lived for a time in Joseph and Anna Smith's household. There she sewed to provide for her family. Then, in 1846, the Myrick family's temporal situation improved when Fanny's mother married Daniel H. Keeler and they moved to St. Louis. It was in this bustling river town that Fanny grew to womanhood and met a young sailor named Paul Ernest Cofer. Paul was a native of Denmark and working in the area as first mate and an interpreter on a passenger boat plying the Mississippi River. He was a boarder in the Keeler home and soon learned about the Mormon church. Paul was baptized in 1848 and the next summer asked for Fanny's hand in marriage. Their first child, a boy whom they named Charles, was born in 1850. Fanny's mother left for Utah in 1852, and, and she too yearned to be reunited with the main body of the church. The following year, Fanny prepared to go west with her son, while Paul felt they should remain at St. Louis, Louis for at least one more year while he worked. The determined young woman set out ahead of her husband and traveled to the outfitting point at Council Bluffs, Iowa. The next thing she knew, she saw Paul among the passengers. I could not let you go alone, so I have given up my job to go with you, he told her. The Colford family joined Captain John Forsgren's Scandinavian company and set out for Utah. A journey Fanny made most of the way on foot with her little son perched on her shoulders. The Colford family was sent with most of the other members of the company to help strengthen the All Red Settlement in San Pete, where they arrived in October 1853. Two months later, hostile Indians attacked and drove out all of the inhabitants of that place, and they fled with rescue wagons to Manti. During that difficult winter, living in makeshift quarters, Paul and Fanny played an important role in helping the Scandinavian <coughs> saints adjust to their new home. Paul served as an interpreter between Danish and English speakers, and Fanny 
patiently assisted the Scandinavian sisters learn how to make salt rising bread and other frontier foods. In the spring of 1854, the Cofords, together with quite a few others who had previously lived at the All Red Settlement, helped found Fort Ephraim. This early settlement provided a unique mixing bowl of diverse cultures. Members of the James and Elizabeth Warren Allred family, an extensive network of people whose roots ran deep into the Old South, headed up the effort. A considerable number of those from the Scandinavian company, who had so recently moved to Manti with the Allreds and their kinfolk, also joined in the venture. In addition to the Scandinavians and, old Ameri and, and the old American families, the remaining approximate one-third of the new settlement's pioneers consisted of people from England, Canada, Scotland, and Wales. Augusta Rasamina Dorius was another remarkable individual who came to San Pete early and, and was among those who first helped settle Fort Ephraim. A native of Copenhagen, Denmark, Augusta witnessed firsthand the coming of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to her homeland. Her family lived in the same building where LDS meetings were held, and her father, Nikolai, who was a, as a Baptist, had become well acquainted with the, script, with the Bible, felt that the Mormon missionaries' teachings rang true with his knowledge of the scriptures. The man labored with his hands as a shoemaker, but took the time to seriously investigate the new religion further. He was fully convinced within a couple of months and was baptized on November 15, 1850. Augusta and her older brother John were also attracted to this new church, and they were baptized on December 14, 1850. She was then 13 years old. Augusta recalled the great opposition people encountered in Denmark as they became associated with the Latter-day Saint faith. Quote, I had to quit school on account of joining this unpopular religion. Augusta also remembered the mobs that gathered to vent their anger. One night, the mob came up to the hall and broke down the door. They wanted to get Brother Rastus Snow and to subject him to bodily punishment. We had to break up the meeting, and Brother Snow walked out with the crowd of saints, and the mob did not get him. Augusta was impressed with the call to gather to Zion and decided to join a small group of 28 Scandinavian Mormons preparing to leave for America with the rest of snow. This trip was made possible because she worked for a wealthy family named Ravens, who were also church members. They took quite an interest in uh, or a liking to me for the work I was doing for them, and they offered me the opportunity to join them in coming to Utah and paid my way. Augusta's father thought it was a good idea and said that the rest of the family could follow later. The young Danish girl was soon caught up with the spirit of travel and adventure. But when I said farewell to my parents and brothers and sisters and the steamboat sailed out so that my folks began to fade out of sight, I felt alone and wept as I then realized for the first time that I was alone to face the world, and that too on foreign soil. The small company traveled from Copenhagen to Liverpool and then boarded a large sailing ship called Italy. A journey of nine weeks followed until the vessel arrived at New Orleans. <clears throat> Augusta later wondered how she had managed to muster the courage to sustain her in such a journey. She concluded it was based on the strength of her faith and personal testimony. It was the gospel I had received and the spirit of the Lord that helped me. I was ignorant of the world and did not understand it as I came to know later. There were few who have such strong faith as those who came from the old country in those days. 
I have never regretted that I came when and as I did, but am thankful to the Lord that I was thus permitted to come to Zion. Augusta became better acquainted with the American mode of transportation across the plains as her company prepared to leave Canesville, Iowa. She said, or she wrote, the women generally rode in the wagons and always slept in the wagons. Personally, I thought they were the most remarkable vehicles I had ever seen. <laughs> During the journey, the young teenager witnessed the terrifying and the serene. Once, stampeding buffalo blocked the company's passage, and on another occasion, a band of Native Americans confronted the party and demanded food. While the evenings were made merry by the sound of a fiddle, dancing, singing, and laughter, Augusta's day was typically long and physically exhausting. Upon nearing the Rocky Mountains, we all had to walk. And after walking a good deal during the day, I felt so tired I should often have been glad to go to bed without any supper. But I always had to help with the supper dishes and help with the camp duties, including the preparing of the beds. At times, Augusta became, a, as, became sad as she thought about her family and began to doubt that her parents could ever make such a journey. She concluded that she would never see them again in this life. I had my sobs and cries and pains of sorrow. What comfort it would have been to me if I could have been able to speak or understand the American language in this new land of America. Fortunately, she had others with whom she could converse in Danish. Especially did I appreciate the kindness of Sister Ravens as she cared for me as if I were her own child, she said. Augusta's company ran out of flour at Green River, and a man was sent by horse to Salt Lake to procure some. It was now October, and the weather had turned cold, and lizards were becoming a frequent sight. Supplies arrived back in time to sustain the company through to the valley, <clears throat> where they arrived on October 16, 1852. Augusta's journey from Copenhagen had taken over eight months. Elder Snow, who had arrived earlier by horse-drawn conveyance and had not spent the month outfitting at Canesville, came out to greet the company and welcome them to Zion. He invited the 28 Scandinavians to his house for dinner. Salt rising bread was one of the items served and was especially tasty to Augusta. I had never tasted a cake so good as that, that salt rising bread after this prolonged and te tedious journey of hardships. Augusta would remain in Salt Lake for another year to live and work with an American family with whom she became acquainted while crossing the plains. These people helped her to learn English better, and Augusta soon learned about a company that was coming, coming that season consisting of many of her men. In the fall of 1853, there came a large company of Scandinavians from the old country, and there were several from my home city of Copenhagen. Augusta decided to join the group to settle the San Pete Valley. After Indian hostilities drove the group from the All Red Settlement, the team moved with the others to Manti. It was there that she met Henry Stevens for the first time. Henry and his wife, Marianne Howe Stevens, were natives of Quebec, Canada and had joined the LDS Church in the 1830s. The Stevens went to Missouri where they lost considerable property at Far West and later lived at Nauvoo. The family came to Utah in 1850 and settled at Payson. By 1853, the Stevens had been called to help settle Sampe and were living at Manti with their four children. Then in the spring of 1854, Henry went with the company that left Manti to establish a new settlement at Fort Ephraim, and Augusta would also join in this effort. Henry helped to erect the first fort at the place. 
During that time, Augusta became better acquainted with Henry, and she consented to become his second wife. The couple went to Salt Lake to be married in the endowment house. Life at Fort Ephraim in the 1850s was marked by hard work performed by men, women, and children, devoted to establishing and maintaining households, farming and carrying out tasks related to a lot of community projects. Erecting the town's fort was one of the biggest endeavors in those early years. Another was developing an adequate irrigation system. One time, in fact, in, in recognition of the extreme labor the men and boys had expended on a canal digging project, women folk of, this, of the settlement decided to treat them to a celebration. It would prove to be a feast reminiscent of Old Plymouth. Fanny Coford's family recalled that the women got together and planned a supper, but what did they have? Each gave the best that she had. A bit of flour, a cup of hoarded sugar, some butter, molasses, dried fruit, or pumpkin. Additional items included bullberries and other wild fruits that were gathered nearby. All the women prepared food and contributed special treats, including pumpkin pies sweetened from boiled sugar cane. It would truly be a day of Thanksgiving with contributions made from across the diverse cultures, including native people. One friendly Indian came with a string of trout, which was duly incorporated into the dinner. A band of marauding Indians killed a calf and two sheep just outside the fort, and strangely enough, and not to their custom, left them lying there. These were dressed and cooked by the women. Fanny Colford raised objections over at least one contribution because her husband Paul was at that time the presiding church leader at Ephraim. She must have been a key organizer of the event. It was recalled by members of the Colford family that one Danish woman brought butter with flies in it. I picked and picked and thought I had them all out before I churned she explained. <laughs> Noting Sister Coford's expression, the woman added, but you can melt it and strain them out and no one will know the difference. <laughs> Fanny was not having it, and the inc but the incident remained memorable and would be laughed about by family members over the years. Finally, the hour of gathering had come, and it was recorded that at four in the afternoon, 150 men were seated at the table, enjoying a wonderful meal. There was enough for all, some to send to those workers and saints unable to attend. These festivities ended with a good old-fashioned dance and thanksgiving. While there were memorable days of fun and celebration at Fort Ephraim in those early years, there were also periods of great challenge and difficulty. The Utah War and the coming of Johnston's army was one such time. Word on the advancing troops had been received in the county by mid-August of 1857. Then on October 9th, an order was sent from Governor Brigham Young requesting that 100 men from the Sanpeak Military District report to Salt Lake to reinforce the troops preparing to confront the invading army. Early the next morning, Warren Snow arrived at Fort Ephraim with, with the dispatch after being only 22 hours on the road. Sleepy residents gathered to learn that orders had come for 40 men from Ephraim and 60 from Manti. It was reported that, quote, the people responded cheerfully to the call and soon had 57 men from the town ready for the journey. Residents also prepared two wagons pulled by two yoke of oxen, four wagons each drawn by two span of horses, two mules, and at least eight additional horses, four saddles, 62 beeves, 143 bushels of oats, 
and $165 worth of provisions and clothing. Much of this preparation was done by the women in the settlement, individuals like Augusta Doria Stevens and Fanny Myrick Coford. Female hands were an incredible and constant source of strength and support in every Mormon community. Two days after receiving the dispatch in Sanpete from Governor Young, Major Snow was halfway to Salt Lake with a detachment of approximately 120 men on their way to the front lines of a mysterious conflict that would come to be known as the Utah War. The people had been informed that this military unit should be equipped for 30 days of service to strengthen the army already out. They had been hastily recruited in answer to a call to defend their beloved mountain home by riding into northeastern Utah and southwestern Wyoming. Men from the local militias who remained behind included Paul Coford and Henry Stevens at Fort Ephraim. This group of individuals vowed to protect the women and children and guard livestock and property in San Peak's two settlements. They were also given the specific charge to harness the crops of their brethren who had gone, quote, out on the road. There were also great concerns about attacks coming from other directions into the territory, including from off the old Spanish trail near present-day Salina. And if San Peak's defenders received instructions from church authorities in Salt Lake, they were also prepared and willing to assist with abandoning the settlements and removing to a new location. Not many details are known about the events directly involving Santee soldiers during that winter campaign. Undoubtedly, their efforts were part of the strategy of guerrilla warfare that effectively prevented advancement of the U.S. military beyond Fort Bridger. The effects of the cold and the rigors of camping in the mountains, however, were clearly being felt by October 25th when a letter was read in Sunday meetings back in San Pete, quote, calling for socks and bedding. It was reported that the people willingly responded to the request for donations on behalf of the brethren, of, quote, the brethren who were out for the defense of Zion against U.S. troops in the mountains. A company of at least 10 men with horses and rations for 15 days left the San Pete Valley and headed northward transporting the fresh provisions which included numerous pairs of stockings, gloves, mittens, blankets, quilts, a buffalo robe, shirts, breeches, and a pair of drawers. Then by the last week of November, the San Peak Military Detachment was out of the mountains and on its way home. The next encounter a large number of San Peak's people had with U.S. soldiers was following the peaceful agreement worked out allowing the military entry into the Salt Lake Valley and the establishment of Camp Floyd, which is west of Utah Lake. During the summer of 1858, 300 federal troops arrived in San Pete, bound for New Mexico. It was while visiting Fort Ephraim that the first known image of a San Pete scene was captured, and it was at Fort Ephraim on July 23, 1858. And there you see a, a view from within, uh, from inside the fort, as uh, concluded the cattle that's where they kept them at night, and I believe that this artist uh, did this sketch fairly early in the morning on July 23, 1858. Private Joseph Hedger was the artist, and the next day he captured a similar scene at Manti. While passage of these troops came off peacefully, major conflict with others arose in December of that year. Approximately 200 soldiers and camp followers entered the San Pete Valley and descended on Fort Ephraim. Their official 
uh, purpose was to establish Camp Porter, apparently somewhere near Fort Ephraim, so that Johnston's army could keep a better eye on Ute Indians in the area, particularly those living in the Arapine Valley at the base of 12 Mile. The reality was this body brought with them 1,600 head of cattle and 1,600 horses and mules to graze for the winter on San Pete's vast marshland associated with the San Pitch River between Manti and Ephraim. This ground, the settlers referred to as the Swamp, an area covered in native grasses, bulrushes, and meadow hay local livestock owners relied on for winter pasturage and feed. At the beginning of the Utah War, Brigham Young had recalled his faithful people from various outlying settlements, including the large and prosperous one at San Bernardino. Among those settlers who returned to Utah was Benjamin L. Clapp, a member of the Church's Presidency of the Seventy, who moved at least part of his families to the San Pete Valley and was living at Fort Ephraim. His activities in Southern California seemed to have diverted his attention away from missionary work, a cause for which he was legendary and instead directed his interest to business. Clapp welcomed the soldiers to Ephraim and told the town's residents it would be treasonous to do otherwise. In fact, he encouraged those opposed to the army's presence to, quote, flee to the mountains to avoid being arrested for treason. He allegedly gave a list of individuals' names whom he felt were treasonous to the acting quartermaster and then arranged for the people to rent their corrals and various buildings to the troops. He also contracted out hay at $15 a ton and wheat at $1.30 per, per bushel. Ephraim's bishop at the time, Paul Coffrey, suggested that they go to Manti to receive counsel from state president Welcome Chapman. But Clapp responded by saying that, quote, they were not subject to the brethren at Manti, and that he was higher in priesthood. Adding that he could make bishops and presidents, and it was all nonsense to go, especially as it would put thousands of dollars into their pockets not to go. End of quote. Manti Bishop Warren Snow went to Fort Ephraim and called the council. He told the settlers that they were selling their hay and wheat too cheap, and that it was quote, not right to feed wheat to mules when perhaps at some time the brethren will be short of bread. Scarcity of feed and foodstuff was a legitimate concern considering the large numbers of livestock in the area. Elder Clapp defended his actions and called Snow an, oppre an oppressor. He left the meeting in a rage and called upon the troops for protection. Tensions remained high between the Mormons in Sampede and the U.S. troops. An incident involving two young men associated with the army and who oversaw government horses feeding in the swamp almost, almost resulted in a small-scale civil war in Sampede. An intense game of cat and mouse ensued over the spring and early summer of 1859 as the military officers sought to arrest Mormons suspected of various crimes. What one local settler called a campaign of self-defense saw a considerable number of Mormon men go into hiding in the nearby mountains. One of the popular hideouts for individuals from Fort Ephraim was a few miles northwest of town in Axe Handle Canyon, so named because of one of the activities these men engaged while camped there in using the native maple wood. Over the next year, most of the U.S. soldiers, civilian contractors, and camp followers left San Pete, especially when the Civil War broke out in South Carolina in April 1860. A fair number, however, remained in the valley, some becoming permanent residents. These are just a few of countless stories that could be related from historic Fort Ephraim. Now, back to our two couples. 
you know, these people were involved in building homes, and uh, this is one of the very unique homes, really, I think, in, this, in the whole territory of Utah at that time, a home that stood here in Ephraim on Main Street, owned by and built by a Peterson family. Uh, but just really, it, it, uh, it, it reflected the faith and the zeal of, of their, the owners and builders of that home. And here is uh, the Gents Whitey home. Uh, again, in starting out, I mentioned how this campus had been, much of this land had been dotted with, with households. Uh, Wayne, you probably remember some of those homes that stood here on this campus. Uh, this was the Gents Whitey home in Manti. Another fine example of a home influenced by Scandinavian settlers. But now back to our two couples. In the spring of 1859, Paul and Fanny Myrick Cofort would assist a newly energized and expanded All Red Settlement Combine and to relocate to their first home in San Pete, a place the founders now call or named Springtown. The Coforts finished raising their children at that place and remained there until their deaths. Paul passing away in 1891, and Fanny in 1911. <clears throat> the Stevens also helped settle Springtown in 1859. Then, in the early 1860s, Augusta joined her husband Henry in settling Dixie. The couple and their children resided in the Rockville area until returning to Sanpete in 1874. Augusta rejoiced to be able to have her last baby born at Fort Ephraim. She was a devoted wife and mother, attending to her aged husband until his death in 1899. Augusta met the demands of many years practicing obstetrics, as they referred to it then. She is said to have brought over 2,000 babies into the world prior to her death at Ephraim in 1926. I thank you for the opportunity to be here, and uh, anyway, I'll open it up for questions. <laughs> Bill Hunt, yes. When are you going to start volume three? <laughs> you know, have you read through volume two yet? <laughs> Just about. Well, when you get through it, let's talk. I, the plan was to do a third volume. I, I tell you, uh, it's, it was quite an ordeal getting through this last volume. But uh, that would be my hope, to at some point come, go up through into the boot, baby boomer generation a, a bit. Well, I really appreciate the meticulous effort that you make on the facts and, and the information that you put on your facts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments or questions? Okay. I'll turn the time back to Mike then. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, we do have uh, David and his family here, and they did bring some copies of the book. Um, I think they're well worth the price, and they're, uh, they're not going to be your $5 Amazon books, but then there, there, there are some really good books written about Ephraim and Manti and, and the San Pete area, but there are not many of them. And so when you get books that are written, especially this comprehensive, I think they're well worth it. Um, I highly recommend them. So you can get those there. They're also sold in places like the, the, the co-op building and uh, Anderson Drug and probably yeah. some places in Manti. Yeah, definitely. We took some over to Anderson Drug just before we came here. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks again. Thank thanks. you very much.